Oh. Wi-Fi okay? Uh, I think we're ready. Yep. Yep. Here we go. Hi, everybody. It's Dami and Jamie with Hometown History, and we are at the Haines Shoe House tonight. Mm -hmm. Here is the location, so I'm sure you've seen it. It is right off Route 30, clear from view, uh, and here is what it looks like from the outside. Although I will say, this was the first time I was here, and holy cow, the pictures do not do it justice. <laughs> when you pull up and see a legitimate, like, shoe? Yeah, a house that's in the shape of a shoe, it is really, really cool. Yeah. So here is our agenda for tonight. So our focus is going to be on Malin Hayes and his successful business that he ran. It stemmed from his childhood with his mom. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to get into renovations of this beautiful home. You can see in the background that it is very fresh, very new. It's very nice. Then we'll get into some failures that he experienced as a young adult and finish with how he eventually became successful. And of course, we have to take our takeaways. We have one every episode. So the publicity stunt or genius marketing strategy, that is the shoe. Uh, Malin Haynes ran 50 successful footwear shops. The shoe house is preserved, a celebration of Yoko's history, and it has a business plan with a promise. Yeah. So a little bit about me, my name is Jamie Norpel, and I have my master's and doctorate in American studies, which is not just history, it is also about culture building. And I recently changed jobs. Yes, you did. I'm no longer a teacher, so I already uh, miss some parts of the classroom, <laughs> but my new position is really exciting. I am the community impact manager for Logos Works, um, and we're doing really cool stuff in York, so stay tuned. I'm sure we will share more about that in the future. Awesome. I'm really happy that you've got a new job and you like it. I am I'm loving it. It Good. is very cool. Yes. That's what matters. And I'm Dami, and you have my name as Dominic Miller, but I'm oh. Dominish Miller in real life. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm just Dominic for this episode. I'm incognito tonight. And I'm the founder of Preserving the History of Newberry Town. That's my side gig, but during the day, I'm a Third Circuit Court of Appeals librarian, and I'm a Civil War reenactor. Okay. And this is my first week off from Civil War reenacting in three weeks. Wow. So and especially at this heat, I'm happy to be in an air-conditioned shoe house. <laughs> I guess July is oh, a popular, popular gosh. time. Oh my gosh, just like the soldiers. I mean, it really hits home what it was like being in the army. So. Oh goodness. Yeah. Okay. So for tonight, um, we were thinking about how, like, what makes York County York County? Mm -hmm. Like when we travel, when people ask us, "Oh, you're from York. What is York known for?" I usually say something like, "Oh, the snack food capital of the world," right. or it is where the Articles of Confederation were written. But Dami, what do you say? Um, agriculture, um, I definitely don't think, like, shoe house, <laughs> off the top of my head. Right, right, You know right. what I mean, but... Like, what are we known for, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I would say snack capital, too. Yeah. That's a huge one. York peppermint patty, mm -hmm. like, cool things like that. Well, we can also say it is the place where we have a house that's in the shape of a shoe. Yes. Which I don't really know of anywhere else in the world that can say that. It makes us very, very special. Yeah, if you live near a shoe, please comment <laughs> below and let us know where you're at. <laughs> that or even when people ask you, oh, you're from your county, what is your county known from? You can say, mm -hmm. oh, well, oh, we'd love to know what you have to say. So all this brings us to Malin Hayes. Yeah, so Malin Haynes owned and operated, you guessed it, shoe stores, hence the shoe. So some say Haynes uh, requested the design by handing a work boot to an architect, and he literally just said, build me a house like this. <laughs> so we have to kind of imagine what that discussion was like. I'm sure a lot of architects aren't asked to build shoes. Right. But it was probably exciting. It's not just the run of the mill house. Uh, yeah. You know, something it's, they've never done before. Which it, should, it speaks to that person's creativity to be able to tackle an issue and be comfortable right. not being comfortable, really. Exactly, yeah. And they used wooden stucco to construct the unique building. And Tom Davidson has supplied us with some photos of what that looked like during the building process. And here are some numbers for you about the shoe house. It's 48 feet long, it's 25 feet high, and 17 feet wide. And it's quite large at approximately 1,500 square feet. And this boot would fail the creek test, meaning you couldn't walk through a creek without it leaking. Because it's been known to struggle with water damage in the toe. And the current owners have fixed that, thankfully. Yeah. And you can see from the aerial photo that we're sharing that it's actually a right boot, although the blueprint makes it look like it would be a left boot. Yeah, I, this is one of history's mysteries. I, uh, my husband works as a, an engineer, and so I was asking him, is there any reason why a blueprint would be flipped? Like, like, mm -hmm. what, this would be a mirrored image because how do you explain this blueprint right here next to this aerial picture of a right 
mood. It's one of history's mysteries, honestly. I'd love to go back and ask the architect, like, did you accidentally build a right, right. boot instead of a left boot? So let's talk about Malin Hayes' mindset. Um, so when he built this house, he wanted to be like a publicity stunt. He mm -hmm. was a showman, kind of like P.T. Barnum. Right. Like I think of him trying to just, you know, get people to come to York and buy his shoes. And really it was a rather expensive marketing strategy. Yeah. In 1948, which was when it was built, it cost $26,000. And in today's money, that would be $328,000 for a publicity stunt. <laughs> I mean, it's expensive to build an entire shoe. <laughs> and he didn't even live in it. <laughs> I know, yeah. Just to show it off and have people gawk at it as they drive yeah, by. Yeah, and oh, I wonder where that came from. Let's figure it out. It was also before Google, though. Exactly. So at the time, you had to be creative. It wasn't just about posting things on Facebook or sharing on social media or having mm -hmm. a web presence. Instead, you had to come up with creative ways to get people to you know, buy what you were selling. Right. So at the time, this was before Route 30, but the Lincoln Highway would have gone right by. Mm -hmm. And so it would have attracted people, think of like tourists. I mean, the Lincoln Highway was kind of like York's Route 66. Exactly. Like that is where people would, even um, Luke and I traveled on Route 30 to go to Bedford a couple of years ago. And we said, instead of taking the turnpike, let's take mm -hmm. Route 30. And it took us a lot longer to get there, but it was kind of cool to go through the small towns. Of, have you ever seen the movie Cars? Yeah. Right? Well, and you see so much more. Yeah. I mean, we got to stop at a bison farm. That's and cool. Of course, we always find it. You see ice cream along the way. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and but today, Route 30 goes right by. Right, so the shoe hype must have worked because his shops were successful during the first half of the 20th century all throughout York County, and he dubbed himself the Shoe Wizard, <laughs> which, you know, you have to be pretty confident in yourself to give yourself that name. Right. And he got wizard from Thomas Edison, the wizard of electricity, and Luther Burbank, the plant wizard. Mm -hmm. Yep. Dami, what would you call yourself the wizard of? Um, I don't know, like wizard, like unofficial <laughs> mayor of Newburytown. Yeah, I love that. Unofficial mayor of yeah. Newburytown. <laughs> I'm not calling myself a wizard. That's a little too highbrow for me. <laughs> well, and like what other marketing techniques has York historically used to try to attract people here? So like Haynes chose the shoe wizard, mm -hmm. but we've also heard of York being called the first capital. Except we're not. That's debatable. Maybe right. in the comments below you can say if you're pro first capital or if you think that that is just, again, a grand marketing scene that York came up with. So let's talk about Malin's childhood. So Malin learned uh, business from his mom. Her, her name was Elizabeth, and she operated a country store out of Ohio. When Malin was very young, not even a year old, his dad passed away, and so she moved him and his two older sisters to Washington, D.C. There is where she started another business, and this was a clothing store. Now, at first, at first, unfortunately, she ended up getting sick, and so her business didn't work. So she moved her three kids to an abandoned saloon in what it was called the slums by near Anacostia. And there she opened another store and had to borrow money. So I think this is a really cool experience for Malin to see his mother fail and pick herself back up again. Right. And fail and, and try again. And, and I think as a young child, when you see somebody that has that persistence and tenacity, that, that had to resonate to him, you know? Right, especially since he did decide to go into a business right. uh, later in life, it obviously left a mark on him. Yeah. Even if he got to see what not to do, you know? Right, I mean, we always learn from mistakes even if they're not our own. Right, so. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Elizabeth Haynes, Malin's mom, ended up investing in a $50,000 building. So that's a lot of money. And yeah. her business grew to the point that she eventually became the largest department store in the world that was owned and operated by a woman, Good for her. as her own marketing <laughs> stated. So, I mean, this is a really impressive family. Heck yeah. Here's a picture of it. This is the building. Again, this is in Washington, D.C. It was built in 1892, and there is her name at the very top. It was along Pennsylvania Avenue and 8th, and it housed 50 different departments on two different floors. Floors. Go Elizabeth. Yeah. They're very good marketers, I have to say. <laughs> so that is where Malin got his first job. After graduating college, Malin worked in his mother's store and he made about $15 a week and his mom kept Malin on a short rope, only allowing him to spend $3 mm. of it. <laughs> Poor savings. Poor Malin. <laughs> she put the rest in a bank account that he wasn't allowed to touch. So honestly, that's a good mom. Mm -hmm. I agree with her. Maybe if I was Malin, I'd be a little salty. Yeah. But despite the low pay, Malin helped run his mom's $400,000 a year business. That's huge. A lot of money. And his side of the story is that she would not let him be a partner. He claims that she wouldn't recognize his hard work either, failing to praise him. So what was his motivation to go out of town? Yeah. 
So let's jump into now a little bit more about the shoe house today and what mm -hmm. it looks like. So it is a Verbo. So you can come and rent this short-term rental. Naomi and Waylon Brown are the current owners. Um, and you can see there it, it is available. You can come and stay here if you want, which is really cool. So let's dive into where we are now. We are, I'm sorry, we are in the rec room, but let's go into the toe first. So in the toe is the living room. Here's a picture of the old living room and mm -hmm. what it looked for, for before it was renovated. And here's what it looks like now. Cha -cha. Fancy. Right? It's very nice. Super fancy. I love the wallpaper. It's very pretty, very bright. Oh, yeah, exactly. I, like, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It is bright. Here's where we are now. This is the rec room. This is the instep of mm -hmm. the shoe. Uh, we are actually sitting on the couch. That couch. <laughs> yep. And you can see there are pictures in the background where they are showing the history, which we love. They even have foosball table, fridge. This isn't even the kitchen. They have a lot of amenities. And a nice TV. One thing we want to point out too is the really cool stained glass as part of the original, which is pretty neat. Now you can see Malin showing off. He was a showman, wasn't he? <laughs> he really was, but I mean, it's beautiful stained glass. If you know of any other faces of people in New York in stained glass, please comment below. I don't know of any other no. portraits of people. And then the kitchen is in the heel of the shoe. So not many people can say that they've cooked breakfast in the heel of a shoe. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Here's the old picture. And then they even have a hot tub in the back of the shoe house, which is super cool. Yeah. So this is more pictures of the kitchen area. It's very bright, again, yeah. like the, uh, the living room area. It's very pretty. And, and here, then here's the hot tub. Yeah, Dami's favorite. Yeah, I That's like a hot tub. Be. And then they have the cutest dog house. Peanut would love that dog house. <laughs> it's super cute. They have a little dog stuffed animal inside chewing on a bone. Oh, that's it's so cute. It's so cute. <laughs> so you're probably wondering, but no, Malin never lived in the house. But years later, after marrying his second wife, he built a home right across the street yeah. from the shoe. So let's jump back into Malin Hayes and his life. Uh, we're going to now get into his mid-20s. So here's a picture of a young Malin. So in his youth, um, he wanted to set out on his own. So initially, he looked to his mom for financial backing, and she didn't really support him. I mean, she did pay for college, which we think is pretty cool. Um, but like Dami already went over, when he worked for her, she only gave him 2 to $5 a week of his wages, and the rest she uh, forced him to save. But now he's an adult, and he is on his own. Oh, so I don't know if you can hear, but my little, my little guy is in the background. And uh, he is... Our co-host, Otto. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to be rogue here for a second and show you a little bit behind the scenes of hometown history. <laughs> There's our cute little man, Otto, four and a half months old, and my amazing husband, who is super supportive. It's Luke's debut <laughs> on <Yeah>. hometown history. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I haven't even noticed that before. Yep. Um, so now though that he was in his 20s, he wanted this money that he had worked for, that he had mm -hmm. saved, and mom basically said, nope, I'm not interested in giving you that. And when he asked for a leadership role, she said no. In fact, she only gave him $200 of his savings. Now, I want to give a quick caveat, because um, as a mom raising a son, <laughs> we, um, we only know Malin's side. He controls right. the narrative. We have not heard from Elizabeth Haynes, so maybe she would have a different side of the story. Mm -hmm. Malin was very prominent newspapers and so he probably yeah. submitted something so keep keep that in mind this is kind of the danger of a single story this is just right. one perspective right so when Haynes turned 25 he took a trip to Europe for two months and a newspaper at the time says he walked out on his mother and broke away broke for the away. first time so that's pretty strong, strong language mm -hmm. yeah yeah he finally got out from under his mother's thumb and he visited Belgium Holland Germany France Scotland England and Ireland that's so he did the whole trip. tour <laughs> yeah I mean two months and he wanted to study the business methods as well as the customs of the people in Europe. So that's really exciting, and that's good for someone who wants to get into business themselves. Mm -hmm. And it was on this trip that he met a young woman who altered his fate. While Haynes was born in Ohio in 1875, she was from Lancaster. And luckily for him, she came, came from money. money. So remember that little piece, because apparently money plays a big role in mm -hmm. Haynes' life. Yep, and this young woman from Lancaster. 
So Haynes, in this point in his life, after coming back from Europe, was very frustrated and he was looking for a wide berth from his mom. And so he moved about as far away as he could and went to California. <laughs> and it was there that he again got into the business world. He decided to try his hand at selling books and clothes. Um, but unfortunately for Malin, he had a little bit of a spending habit. Uh, so we learned uh, when we were growing up that one of the basic household tenements is that you have to spend less than what you make. Right. Malin did not do that. <laughs> he spent way more uh, than what he made. And it made me think about what is my like treat yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, what do I do as like my guilty pleasure of what I spend money on? Right. Dami, what do you do? Um, so Civil War reenacting is expensive. <laughs> so stuff for Civil War reenacting. And then my mom and I like to get our nails done mm -hmm. like once a month when I'm not Civil War reenacting. So, I like how you have that caveat. Yeah, when I don't have to dress like a man. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would look out of place, right? Yeah, I don't think Civil War soldiers had like super nice manicures, <laughs> which is why they're unpolished today. But yeah, that's like my one treat, treat yourself. yourself. TNC nails in Newbury Town. <laughs> and, and your nails always look really nice. And they're oh, creative and they're different. I try. Yeah, I've had peanut on my nails. I've had mm. pudding my cat on my nails. Oh, you said that, that's her dog, not like an actual <laughs> peanut. Unless you did have an actual peanut. No, no, not a real peanut. I've had the Dallas Cowboy. Yeah, that's <laughs> the one I remember. I think that's when I met you. I was like, okay. Okay, this yeah. girl knows how to party. All right. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately for Malin, his thing uh, was going out, which is, I would say, probably how would I spend my money on. Okay. Like, I, I will treat myself to the nice dinner and mm -hmm. the wine, and I, and I definitely like a charcuterie board, Ooh. which is ridiculously expensive, they but are. that's like my thing. And plants. Plants, yeah. That's another I one. Buy a lot of plants. I buy plants. Yeah, I you buy plants, too. Yeah. We need to just start, like, sharing plants. Guilty as <laughs> Um, so Haynes, he really uh, unfortunately lived a life that was rather broke because he was not smart with his money. So mom did help out occasionally. She would send him $50 here, $100 here, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but today that'd be about $3,000 in today's money. It is, yeah. For, I mean, a mother to help their grown son, mm -hmm. who's an adult and out on his own, yep. you got to give her that. Right, unless it was from his own bank account. <laughs> I know. The money she'd been hoarding for him. Now he also, though, spent the money traveling because Ooh. he would make his way back to the East Coast to see a special lady in Lancaster Ooh. about 10 different times. So we're not exactly sure who this woman was. Stephen Smith ended up piecing together the story and thinks that she was either Anne or Catherine Watt. They were twin daughters of Peter Watt who co-owned Watt and Shand Department Store. So Peter Watt must have helped the Haynes find footing on the East Coast because Haynes picked York. <laughs> did you, did you ha, catch ha, that footing? footing, footing. That, that was, I think, Stephen Smith. That wasn't me. Oh, okay. I was going to say, Jamie writes our script, no. so that was either you or Stephen Smith. Good job. I love a pun. So he found footing on the East Coast, and he chose York to start a business, and there he rented a store for $112 a month, and he also rented an apartment for his bride-to-be, mm -hmm. decorating it and furnishing it as she liked, and some say her dad ended up paying for it. Yeah. So that's kind of lame. Uh, Come on, Haynes. And unfortunately, this apartment ended up causing them to break off the marriage yes an apartment caused oh, a breakup that's so dramatic um, so paul hold on to that we will tell more about how uh the marriage or the uh, marriage engagement was broken off but first we wanted to show you some of the bedrooms that you can rent out if you choose to stay at the shoe house so here is one of the bedrooms i love again the shoe puns yeah in step suite, in step suite. here's a nice bed look at the tribute to the shoe house there in the picture here is the shoelace space. Cute. I get retro wallpaper. I love it. Uh huh. Bathroom, they kept the nice tile, um, original tile from the original house. Cool wallpaper. This is my favorite bedroom. It is the, the angle, angle abode. abode. And here's why look at this mural. It's the old woman in the shoe. That's so cool. It looks very Pennsylvania Dutch inspired. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they came in and um, invested in this house makes Dami and I very happy that people are looking at York as a destination for people to come to. So we're right. excited by that. Okay, so we're going to talk about the owners now. Uh, when Naomi and Waylon first purchased the property, the locals had grown to love the shoe house and they got worried. Uh, were they going to preserve the property? Would they get rid of the collectible items? Because this really was like a museum that mm -hmm. you could tour and open to the public. So the proof is in the pudding, or in this case, the penny loafer. <laughs> Another pun, Jamie. That was me. That was me. <laughs> so uh, Naomi says that the history is neat. Otherwise, it would be a weird house along the highway. Mm -hmm. So I get it. You have to tie it into what it was originally for. Yeah. yeah. So that would just be kind of creepy. Like, look at this normal house. And by the way, it's a shoe. It's a sh it just happens to be a shoe. Yeah. 
So this made us think about um, how important it is to come up with an economically viable way to celebrate history. Mm -hmm. Because as much as Dami and I would love to preserve every single thing that we ever possibly could, yes. someone has to pay for it. And mm -hmm. the fact that they were able to take something that has a lot of rich history in New York and have this promising business plan that hopefully will be very successful for mm -hmm. them, while also making sure that there is a tip to the hat to the history makes us very happy. It does. So we're hoping that there are more economically viable ways to merge history and enterprise in mm -hmm. your County, so we can. Uh, I mean, because I mean, what is our our most recent marketing um, slogan? It's historically edgy, right? So playing that history and uh, you know getting more people interested in that history would be pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. So we also want to show you this quick picture of the logo too, which is really cool. I like it. Yeah. 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 Very clean. Yeah. So now let's get into Naomi and how she knew some of the previous owners. So you've probably heard the name before, Melanie Schmuck. She was one of the previous co-owners and she passed away in 2019 from health complications. Melanie and her husband, Jeff, uh, bought the shoe house in 2015 and they offered tours and sold sweet treats like ice cream, cake pops, and sugar cakes. And the shoe house served as the headquarters for Melanie's baking business, Melly's Makery. Mm -hmm. Melanie and Jeff did an excellent job of showcasing the history of the shoe house. And for example, you can check out the picture of the Hanes baby shoes that were on display. <laughs> so, you know, they had um, a business running, but they also kept true to the history and had certain uh, mementos of the Hanes family that you could see. Yeah. yeah. You can, again, you can see history all over the place. Yep. So let's now jump back into Malin as a teenager and why his marriage uh, broke off with the Watt sister. We're not sure which one. So what, here's basically what happened. He got in a fight with his mother-in-law. Guys, be nice to your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my mom loves Luke. <laughs> but it, it, how a man treats his mom is an indication Absolutely. of how they're going to treat you. And why would you want to be married to someone that doesn't like your parents? Right, yeah. So here is a picture from a newspaper oh. that came out. And that's an old newspaper you can see there um, from the 1980s. And this is, again, uh, shout out to Stephen Smith, who was able to find this. But they quarreled over the apartment's wallpaper. And oh, my for goodness. Tonight. And apparently he says that he even changed it twice, but she got angry. And so that was one of the reasons why the engagement broke off. And that future father-in-law father withdrew his promise to back him. So there he lost an investor. Now, he didn't end up marrying until 1909 to a woman named June Brown um, Irwin. So <laughs> poor Malin the steep cost of rent for him for his business um he found himself again broke yet again so enter mom Ooh. elizabeth haynes she's and, back yep and she again told haynes to come back home come to washington dc i will be here to support you but he disobeyed this time he went to savannah wow. yeah savannah georgia he's brave yep so one of the reasons why the shoe house is the center of tonight's hometown history episode is because of a brand new Pennsylvania historical marker that went in today. Today. So I'm going to read you the language that's on the new historical marker. Built in 1948 for York entrepreneur Malin Haynes, the shoe wizard, to promote his chain of stores, the 25 foot high, 48 foot long shoe shaped guest house is considered a notable example of mid 20th century pragmatic architecture. Functional buildings shaped like objects or animals for advertising purposes. Visible from the Lincoln Highway, it's become an icon of the historic coast-to-coast -coast road, and seniors and honeymooners stayed for free. Oh, that's so cool. Here's a picture of the dedication event. Shout out to Jim McClure, who is our mastermind behind the computer, who was there today taking mm -hmm. images, and also Tom Davidson, who was instrumental in getting this marker in and was the curator of the writing. We are gonna have him on at the end of this episode for our extra, where we get to interview him and ask him more questions about the shoe house. Awesome. So if you look back at that sign, it says that Malin Hayes, um, he was a millionaire. And so you might be wondering, okay, his mom failed and then eventually became successful. Mm -hmm. Malin failed a lot, but eventually he did become successful. So what happened? Well, getting to York, some say that it was because of him getting involved with the Watt sister. But there's this other fun local legend that says that Haynes showed up in New York because of a bicycle. The legend goes that he was coming back after the breakup on a bicycle to Washington, D.C., and his bike broke down in York County, Pennsylvania. Interesting. And it was here that he sold the engagement ring, 
use it to buy 10 pairs of shoes, what found success selling them in a farmer's market, and then stayed. And now here's where he's at. Mm. This guy had a lot of drama in his life. He but did. It's super interesting. <laughs> Broke down on a bicycle, yeah. bought some shoes. Yeah. And again, he controls the narrative, so that's his side of the story. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting story, it though. It is. So finding success in York, arguably for the first time, he ended up deciding to stay in New York, and he grew a shoe business on South George Street through bizarre marketing techniques. So traveling shoe store, which, you know, is super interesting. Yeah, I love that picture. And then he hired a daredevil to walk on a tightrope between two of his shops. And then he pulled, um, he was pulled by an ox pulled cart with Shane, Haynes shoe from hoof to hoof painted directly on the animals. So he was quite the showman. And of course he uh, knew how to build a house in the shape of a shoe. And by 1935, when he was 65 years old, he owned 50 shoe stores in Pennsylvania and Maryland. That's, that's impressive. It's very impressive. Stores, yeah. So Haynes also had other business ventures in New York. So very close to the show. Oh, sorry. This is not owned by Haynes. This is another business venture that is not associated with Haynes, but is very, very close. And that is a tree house. It was known as the Brookleaf Love Nest. And it was very close to here. It was uh, overhung Croitz Creek in Hellam. And it was advertised to newlyweds as this perfect place for a honeymoon. The owners installed a coal stove so it could be used all year round. That came from Sears and the newlywed had to carry water from the nearby farmhouse. Now Haynes himself also found himself in the short-term rental business. Here's a picture of a hotel that he operated that was on the northwest corner of North Georgia and West Philly. You probably recognize it if you drive through York at all and just go up North George. Um, so that used to be owned by Haynes. He also started a horse racing enterprise, and here's an aerial picture of it, and the land west of it was developed into what is today known as Haynes Acres. Which I didn't know. Like, I didn't know Haynes Acres. Oh, really? Was that was by related. Haynes. Yeah. That, I think that's why this is cool, because, like, as much as you know about history, every you time learn as you go, learn something yeah. new. Well, that's the point. <laughs> when he died in 1962, he was gifted his house to his, he gifted his house to his employees, and they sold it two years later to a dentist who gave tours and sold ice cream. And then it switched hands a few more times, including Haynes' granddaughter, Annie Haynes Keller, in the 1980s. And Naomi and Waylon, the current owners, are the eighth, eighth owners. owners. And they told me that they um, Haynes' great granddaughter stayed here over the Fourth of July. Really? Came back. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, so cool. Yeah. Another thing that Haynes did was he donated land. So he owned some land over there. You can see it says Wizard Ranch. You can guess that was owned by Haynes <laughs> right along the Susquehanna River. And so initially when he first passed, it was donated to the Boy Scouts. But most recently, it is now a part of the Lancaster Conservatory. And it is a part of the ever-growing and very important job to preserve green spaces in York County. Absolutely. And it's not the only cool happening in New York current day. Shoe right. House has some events. Yeah, so you can rent the house for yourself because it's a Verbo, but you can also run here too. So there's also a five mile race called the Shoe House Shuffle that occurs every year. And here's an iconic picture of a barefoot runner passing the house a few years ago. And Frank Devonzo of E-Town says lower leg injuries motivated him ditching his shoes and running barefoot. So he's a brave man. It's just funny. Like it's so like ironic. No shoes running past a shoe. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> God bless him. And then today there's a lot of memorabilia, such as these cute little shoes that are salt and pepper shakers. So everything in the house, it really ties in the whole shoe the theme. theme. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we're wrapping up here, we're hoping that if you stayed with us, that you are walking away a little bit smarter with these four takeaways. One was that when Haynes built this shoe house, it was either a publicity stunt or a genius marketing strategy, depending on your opinion. Yeah. Business owners out there, if you could comment below <laughs> by the craziest idea you've ever had to like market or get people into your business. Um, Malin Haynes is, uh, was a very successful businessman in New York, and he owned all uh, 50 different shoe stores mm -hmm. in uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland. And today, the shoe house is preserved. It's a celebration of York County's history, and there's a really cool business plan associated with it to bring in money to York County. Yes. So that's the end of our talk for tonight. But if you stay tuned, we will be talking to Tom Davidson in about 15 minutes. Yeah. And our next full episode is going to be August 22nd at 7 p.m. at the Zimmerman Center in Long Level. And it's going to be open to the public, but seats will be limited. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about the Susquehannocks and other Native Americans yeah, that night. I'm excited for that one, too. Yeah, no, so cool we can't stuff. wait to see you guys. Thanks. See ya.